Hello everyone. I'm Dr. Susan Hsu. I'm a paediatric gastroenterologist at Children's Hospital Westmead. It's my pleasure today to chair and welcome you all to our advanced therapeutics webinar series, where we focus on the rapidly evolving space that is advanced therapeutics as it presents innovative and potentially transformational treatments for children now and in future years. Before we get started, I'd like to begin with acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands on which we are all meeting today. This web webinar is being hosted from the traditional lands of the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation in the east and the Buramatagal people of the Darang Nation in the west of Sydney. We pay our respects to elders past and present and, and acknowledge the community members, Aboriginal staff, services and organisations who are closely with us to improve the health and well-being of children and young people, their families and communities. So we are joined today by two knowledgeable experts as we discuss the topic of viral vectors. We welcome Dr. Samantha Jin and Dr. Grant Logan, who will take us through everything we need to know about the use of viral vectors in new and novel health treatments. Following the presentations, our panel will open for discussions. So please submit your, any questions you have throughout the seminar in the Q&A tab in the Zoom controls. And if you have any questions that, you would, that have been submitted that you would also like answered, you can upvote the questions by clicking the thumbs up beside it. Now let's begin with Dr. Samantha Jin. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you, Susan. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, joining. Um, so in the next um, few minutes, I would like to tell you a little bit about um, viral vectors and um, gene therapy in general. Um, where is my... There we go. So um, today I'd just like to give you a little bit of a scope um, of gene therapy, uh, give you a bit of a historical perspective and the current gene therapy landscape um, before um, diving into some of the different gene therapy vectors, uh, discuss in vivo versus ex vivo gene therapy, uh, and then a few um, key examples of some clinical successes recently um, before handing over to um, Grant Logan, who's going to talk um, to you more about um, AV. Um, in particular. So the current definition by um, the EMA of gene therapy is the deliberate introduction of genetic material into human somatic cells for the purposes of therapeutic, prophylactic or diagnostic purposes. And I've just highlighted here that it's um, somatic cells that we're treating. So we're not uh, performing any um, gene therapy to the germ cells. So these are non-heritable um, therapies. And so the idea of gene therapy is conceptually very simple, um, but in practice, it's um, quite complex. Uh, so progress has been really underpinned by development in the underlying technology, in particular, um, our ability to deliver the therapies to the cell types and um, tissues that we want, and that those effects are durable and efficient enough to provide therapeutic benefits. So we really are living in exciting times in the field of gene therapy. And this has really been um, due to, I guess, most recently um, recombinant DNA um, revolution, where we're able to manipulate DNA, we're able to cut and clone and amplify DNA and create um, the vectors that we need to use. Um, and then also more recently, uh, DNA and RNA sequencing revolution that's provided um, a vast amount of knowledge um, that we're able to uh, tap into. And so really that has led us to be able to have some diagnostic power. So what is um, the problem and there really is a gap now between what we know and the therapeutic power. And that is, you know, how can we fix the problem now that we know what that problem is? So this is the gap that we're trying to address. And so the pipeline of gene and RNA cell therapy. So currently there's over 3,600 um, gene therapies in development. Um, and you can see here, um, these are just graphed by year up until um, May last year. And the overwhelming um, number of those in this dark blue bar are in the preclinical phase. Uh, but you can see that there's been an uptick in phase one, phase two, and um, you know, slowly into phase three and pre-registration. Uh, but just to give you a sense of um, the field of gene therapy, the first authorized gene therapy trial um, was performed in 1989. And this was just a marker gene trial to address safety. And then it was oh, 11 years since um, 
the next um, successful or the first successful gene therapy trial was reported in the year 2000. Um, and this was for um, SCIDX1 or boy in the bubble disease. Um, this was published, um, the results of two boys um, with SCIDX1 um, in science. And then it was another 11 years after that before the first AV um, gene therapy for haemophilia was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011, which reported on the successful um, treatment for adults using AAV. And then more recently, and only a few years after um, the haemophilia trial, uh, was a report of um, CAR T cell therapy um, for chronic lymphoid um, leukemia. Um, and this product is now um, uh, in the clinic here in the Sydney Children's Hospital Network. And then also probably um, you might have heard about, you know, the very exciting uh, results for SMA, for children with SMA, um, again, being treated in the Sydney Children's Hospital Network, um, again, using AAV um, gene therapy. And so let's talk about some of the um, gene delivery systems that are um, that are options um, when considering gene therapy trials. So they can be broadly classed as non-viral and viral. And I will concentrate on viral vectors, but I will mention um, that there are non-viral gene therapy options. Um, and also uh, just to um, point out lipid nanoparticle technology, which is really um, starting to come into its own. And I'll finish on that, um, just mentioning a clinical trial using LMPs that um, is now in the clinic. Uh, so uh, there are many non-viral options, and here is just two examples. So either naked DNA on LMPs, and these are less efficient than um, viral vectors, but um, they do only need to um, deliver their payload to the cytoplasm. But by far the um, majority of trials um, are using viral vectors, and these are just a couple of examples here. So um, some that you may have heard of, adenovirus, AAV, which is... Um, you know, really driving a lot of clinical um, excitement at the moment. And then our integrating vectors, uh, retroviral vectors and lentiviral vectors. And these vectors all have different properties um, that make them appealing for different um, target tissues and, and diseases and, um, you know, careful consideration of, of the properties um, that you need are, is important with a gene therapy trial. But um, these um, viral vectors need to deliver their cargo um, to the nucleus, and we call that um, transduction. So these viral vectors uh, are recombinant, so uh, we don't think of it as an infection, but rather as a transduction. And so here are four of the probably most commonly used viral vector gene delivery systems, but by far they're um, only just a few. Um, and really a lot of points to consider. So the size of the vector, you know, can it um, reach the tissue that you're interested in? Um, the genome, whether it's a DNA or an RNA virus. Um, what's really important is the packaging capacity of that virus. So uh, for AAV, uh, we have quite a limited packaging capacity of only 4.7 kilobases. So all the um, DNA payload that you need to um, deliver needs to fit into, into that. So whether you have a promoter and a transgene, um, any regulatory sig signals, they all need to be um, encompassed in that 4.7 kilobases. Uh, question about whether you can transduce dividing or non-dividing cells. So uh, for gamma retroviruses, which are probably now being um, superseded by lentiviral vectors, you needed the cell to be dividing, which limited um, options um, historically. Also the transduction efficiency, you know, whether the um, viral vector itself integrates the payload into the genome of your target cell. So whether they're an integrating as your um, gamma and lentiviral vectors are or non-integrating is important. So for targeting uh, diseases, say of the BOMO for those early um, SCIDX1 trials, uh, you really need to have an integrating vector because you're targeting progenitor cells that proliferate. So if you want stable long-term therapy, an and AAV vector is, is not going to be a good option. And, and that's mentioned here, whether you've got transient or stable expression. Um, probably less relevant here is um, the biosafety level. Um, most of these are maintained at biosafety level two or what we call um, PC2. Uh, also the immunogenicity of the vector and then what strategy uh, these vectors are being used for. So um, in vivo versus ex vivo, and I'll, I'll mention some examples in the slide um, following. Um, so here you can see these are some of the common vectors and um, the number of trials currently in the clinic. Um, with adenoviral vectors, you can see that they're um, 
you know, by far the most popular vector at the moment. And there's really been a large um, sort of exponential increase in the use of AAV vectors over the last few years. Um, lentiviral vectors are also um, being used quite frequently, um, and you can see that they're now being used more frequently than uh, retroviral vectors, um, partly because you're able to um, transduce both dividing and non-dividing cells, but they also have a, a more favourable integration profile, so uh, a move from retroviral to lentiviral vectors for safety. Um, so uh, the overwhelming majority, as I mentioned, of um, vectors being used in the clinic are viral vectors and AAV and lentia are, are still the most common. Um, but there has been a, an increase in the number of um, trials using herpes simplex virus more recently. So I mentioned um, ex vivo versus in vivo gene therapy. Um, and I'm just going to take you through um, a few examples on this slide and, and what that means. So uh, ex vivo means gene delivery to cells uh, outside of the body. Um, so in this situation, you would collect cells from the patient, uh, if it was autologous or potentially a donor as an allogeneic transplant. Uh, you would select the cell type that you're interested in. So you might be interested in um, the bone marrow progenitors, uh, or CD34 positive cells, T cells, and then you would genetically modify those cells, uh, whether you need to have amplification or rounds of um, selection to increase the number of cells before returning them to, to the body. And as I mentioned, um, vectors of choice, uh, lentiviral vectors, um, because of their long-term uh, expression uh, due to the integration profile, but also if you want to deliver something transiently, you can just um, use electroporation, which is a physiochemical, physiological um, way of delivering um, your DNA or RNA cargo to those cells. So you may um, deliver a nucleic acid or um, expression cassette or even um, genome editing tools more recently. And currently, uh, lentiviral vectors are the dominant um, delivery choice, uh, and you may have heard of some of these um, currently approved um, products, so Chimera, Yescada, um, are CAR T cell therapies. So for in vivo gene therapy, um, there's sort of two options. You could do a local injection directly into uh, the organ of, that you're interested in, such as the case with uh, Lux Turner. Um, or you might do a systemic injection um, into the bloodstream. And the delivery uh, vectors of choice at the moment are AAV, um, and also, as I mentioned, um, lipid nanoparticles are also um, becoming, um, for certain um, conditions, particularly targeting the liver, um, quite successful. Again, you can deliver um, either a nucleic acid or genome editing tool. Um, and so currently, as I mentioned, AAV is the dominant vector choice here. Um, and you may have heard of um, Glybera, Lux Turner, and Zolgensma, um, all in the clinic for um, gene therapy uh, in, directly in vivo. And so just before I finish, I thought I might give you a few examples of some successful um, gene therapy um, trials um, uh, in each category. So for ex vivo gene therapy, um, gene addition has been the most common form where you're adding in an extra um, copy of a, a disease gene, but more recently genome editing is also becoming possible, um, predominantly uh, integrating vector systems for the reasons that I mentioned, and there's been a transition from gamma retroviral to lentiviral vectors uh, to improve the safety profile of the gene therapy. And um, usually primary immune deficiencies and CAR T cell therapies have been the most common um, sort of targets for ex vivo gene therapy. And here, um, uh, that was the science paper that I mentioned back in the year 2000, uh, using a gamma retroviral vector. And more recently, a few years ago, um, there was a report for the same disease, uh, now using lentiviral vectors, reflecting that change in um, delivery technology. And also um, here, Chimera uh, is also being used for CAR T cell therapy. Uh, so for in vivo gene therapy, uh, the example I have here is for spinal muscular atrophy. So this was reported um, in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2017. Um, and it was um, currently um, given AVXS101 um, was the drug and it is now um, known as Zolgensma. So this was pre-symptomatic um, children with SMA um, given soon after birth. And this is now a marketed therapy on the PBS. Um, so very exciting to see um, that progress so quickly. 
And then I can't really, I guess, talk about gene therapy without at least briefly mentioning genome editing technology. And so this really is the next wave of gene therapies. Um, and we're already seeing um, these um, technologies enter the clinic with um, some demonstrated clinical benefit. And what um, is so revolutionary about these is that we're able to permanently change um, the genome, uh, either by adding, removing, or altering um, DNA at very precise and desired locations. Um, so it's very powerful um, a tool, not only for gene therapy, but for also gene modeling and um, other um, technologies. Uh, and this was recognized um, back in 2000 by winning the Nobel Prize of Chemistry for this technology. So finally, um, as I mentioned, um, uh, genome editing technology is already entering the clinic. Um, so this is a study um, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, just um, mid last year for transthyretin amyloidosis. Uh, and this is using, uh, in this case, it's a non-viral gene therapy um, using lipid nanoparticles. Um, so this is a progressive condition caused by the buildup of um, abnormal deposits of amyloid protein. And they're using the genome editing technology to um, knock out the function of, of, of the transthyretin gene. So um, this is inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. So traditional gene therapy where you're adding an extra copy would, um, wouldn't work in this case. So we actually need to um, knock out the function. And so they used um, LMPs to deliver the genome editing technology. Uh, and as a result, that caused um, mutations in the genome, which knocked out um, the function of this gene in the liver. Uh, so there was an existing RNI therapy. So that's, that's still um, in the clinic at the moment on Patro. Uh, but this required patients to have uh, injections every three weeks, um, whereas now with the CRISPR um, genome editing technology, using a single um, delivery, they're able to um, produce a permanent change for the life of this patient, hopefully. So um, very exciting um, technology. So with that, I'd like to um, hand over to, to Grant and um, thank you for um, listening. Thanks, Sam, and, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm going to continue on from, from Sam's discussion, um, but focus more on um, one particular gene delivery system that we've come to love, which is adeno-associated virus. So um, I want to just give you a, a sense of um, how this vector system has come into development. Uh, I'm going to focus on the importance of the vector coat protein and the performance of this vector. And I'm just going to um, make you aware of some of the um, some of the work that we've been doing on this campus in terms of patient pre-screen for anti-vector antibodies, um, which is an important aspect to understand uh, before some patients can receive certain AAV gene therapies. Uh, so, adeno-associated virus itself, we've known for very long. It's um, discovered in the mid '60s. It was found not to cause pathology. Uh, it is replication defective, so it requires the presence of other viruses to complete the virus cycle. So these red arrows here are pointing out adeno-associated virus particles in an electron micrograph, and you can see accompanying these are these large, larger viruses, which in this instance is adenovirus itself. Um, so the other thing that AAV has that's an appealing feature as a gene delivery system is it has low rates of genome integration, but it also can maintain long-term um, maintenance of its viral genome in non-providing cells. So examples of these are muscle cells, hepatocytes in the liver, and neurons, which have become a very attractive gene therapy target for AV vector systems. And as a consequence of this, we're now finding ourselves after such a long time researching gene therapy actually seeing clinical benefit in um, hospitals. And in particular, in this country, um, Zolgensma has recently been listed on the PBS to treat spinal muscular atrophy. And Luxterna has also been treated to, uh, to treat blindness. But we're finding coming through the clinical pipeline other AV gene therapies um, that will target haemophilia, both haemophilia A, haemophilia B. So these are liver targeted therapies 
uh, muscular dystrophies. Um, so these are, are targeting, systemically targeting muscle cells. And there are some um, metabolic liver diseases that are, are being targeted as well, which are in late phase clinical trial. So this uh, slide just shows you the genome structure of, of AAV itself. And AAV is a very simple virus. It's, um, it's all viruses are small, but AAV is one of the smallest at 25 nanometers. And uh, it has a very simple genome structure encoding non-structural and structural proteins that encode a variety of different proteins. But the important thing to understand here is that we can strip out all of these viral coding sequences and simply keep these short genetic sequences at each end of the viral genome, which is all we need to do in order to be able to create a delivery system that can deliver a, a genetic cargo, um, encoding anything we want, so long as it's within a certain size restriction. So one of the downsides of AAV is that it has a small genome packaging capacity but we're finding that this is more than sufficient to really come at a whole host of different diseases um, to try to affect uh, in vivo clinical benefits. Um, so there's a variety of routes that you might like to deploy this delivery system, depending on the uh, tissue of interest that you're looking to, um, to treat. Um, there's the local injection into the eye, um, if you want to target the, um, the uh, central nervous system, you could go uh, systemically. Some AV vectors have the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier, but you could also go via the intrathecal route as well. Um, and there is um, some work happening on the planet where people are actually looking to develop AAV as a delivery system into the ear to try to um, cure genetic deafness. The roots of injection depend on the target tissue, as I just mentioned, and the AAV vectors themselves are excreted or secreted from patients after a victim administration in all possible, um, all possible excretions and secretions. Um, and shedding will occur days to months after infusion, but this does depend on the dose and the route of delivery. So there would be very little um, excretion of AAV when injected locally in small doses into the eye. But much larger um, amounts of shedding of the vector system um, from a variety of places um, when you're delivering high dose systemic gene therapy. So whilst the genome or the genetic cargo that we're looking to deliver is extremely important, um, the other important aspect of this delivery system is the caps of this is the protein coat that goes around uh, the vector system, the vector genome. Um, it uh, provides stability to the delivery system. It protects the genetic cargo from, from decay. It enables this vector to traffic through the body uh, and find a particular cellular target and then transport the genetic cargo to the nucleus of the cell where it can affect its action. And what's really lovely about this system is that we're finding that we can package our genetics uh, cargo into any number of different coat proteins, each of which will have a preference for a particular uh, cellular target. So if we're looking to target uh, the liver, we might go for AAV2 or LK03. If we're targeting skeletal muscle, um, we might go for AAV9 or ARH74, which are in late phase clinical development. So, the capsid functionality will differ between species, and this is slowed clinical translation of the technology. So what works really well in the liver of a mouse doesn't necessarily work very well in the liver of humans. Um, and it's taken a while for us to understand which capsids work well in the context of human diseases. Um, but we are now blessed with the choice where we can pursue naturally um, occurring AV capsids or we can even generate them through synthetic, uh, generate synthetic capsids using uh, recombinant um, technologies. Now, this slide gives you a sense of the different sorts of capsid serotypes that are being used, represented along this axis here, the number of clinical trials here, um, and the color coding indicates the sorts of diseases that are being targeted. So we've got blood disorders, central nervous system, eye diseases, 
neuromuscular disorders. Um, so Luxterna is an example of an AAV2 capsid protein. Um, Solgensma and uh, another gene therapy uh, coming from Pfizer for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy deploys an AV9. Um, and uh, Spark is using this, this capsid system here, LK03, which was uh, developed by Leszek Lazowski in Mark Kay's lab laboratory at Stanford, and Leszek is now within the Children's Medical Research Institute um, running his laboratory here. So uh, this one's very dear to our hearts. The thing that's important to understand is that AV is endemic in the, com in the community. So natural exposure can stimulate antibody responses to the AV capsid that has the capacity sometimes to neutralize an AV gene therapy. And so anti-AV antibody pre-screening is one of the selection criteria that companies use to determine patient eligibility. And this is particularly important from uh, when one is looking to deliver AAV systemically. Pre-screening is not done for Luxterna, but it is done for other therapies where it is uh, via the intravenous route. And the other thing that's important, um, I think, to understand as well is that once an individual has been treated with AAV gene therapy, especially systemically, that does generate an anti-vector antibody response that would preclude, preclude re-administration of AAV, even if one were to use a different capsid serotype. Um, we're finding that kids treated with AV9 Zolgensma um, based therapy are developing quite high antibody responses to a whole range of different capsid serotypes in a, in a, in a, at a level that would preclude them from being retreated. Um, so if one's considering an AV gene therapy, it's important to try to get it right for these patients in the first instance. So antibodies here are shown in a French study to um, in different individuals and you can see that there's cross-reactivity to a whole range of AV capsid serotypes. AV2 is endemic in the community. And we believe that this is then producing cross-reactivity to a whole range of different AV capsid serotypes. And this slide here in, is a North American study that shows that, um, that antibodies to AV are acquired in early years of life. So up until the age of um, one year or 12 months, a progressive decrease in antibody titers and this is through loss of um, antibodies that are eternally transferred across the placenta uh, but then within the first three years there's this uptick in in antibody levels which uh, progressively um, increase and then stabilize through late teens so pre-screening is an important part of of this consideration and also capsid choice is important for the perspective of finding capsid serotype that um, may elude these sorts of cross neutralizing responses. So as I said, patient access to systemic AV gene therapy is dependent on a pre-screen and the sponsors at the moment are mandating pre-screens are conducted in international reference laboratories and these can be using ELISAs or cell transduction assays through cell-based um, cell systems. And we were finding that this was slowing recruitment and it was also expensive to send sera to these laboratories to understand the sera prevalence of AV antibodies in certain patient cohorts. So we received some funding from the Office of Health and Medical Research um, to develop an, AA, an AAV assay that would measure anti-AV9 IgG in patient sera. Um, and uh, we chose AAV9 because it is the, it is the sera type used in, in Zolgensma. So with much help from Alison Kesson in uh, Children's Hospital of Westmead Pathology and uh, Susan Badman, uh, we were able to get this test NADA accredited. Um, it received certification and TGA registration in April this year. It's performed in the Department of Pathology and it indicates the patient anti-AV9 IgG status. And we're working at the moment to benchmark this assay against the results that we've received from overseas reference laboratories. We have a grand plan here because we see that um, understanding patient sera prevalence is, is a really vital tool for helping to encourage clinical trial activity to Australian shores. So we're looking to develop further assays against other AV serotypes that are coming through the clinical pipeline. We want to bring this testing online 
And we want to provide a state or an interstate or even an international service for AV serology and eventually establish a national serology reference laboratories with the view that we might be able to, to test um, patient cohorts who may be eligible to receive AV gene therapies that are currently in clinical development. So if people are interested in AV therapy and they're seeing something coming down the pike that may benefit their patient cohorts, I'd be very interested in talking to them about the possibility of testing patient serum against a particular CATS and serotype to take this sort of effort forward. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'll hand back to Susan. Thanks very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Sam and Grant, for the wonderful presentations. And thanks to those who have submitted questions. I'd now like to introduce to you Dr. Michelle Lorenzos, who's a paediatric neurologist from the Children's Hospital at Westmead, who will facilitate the Q&A session today. Thanks, Susan, and thanks for the speakers. Um, we already have one question here um, that's been sent in. Um, and I think this goes to speak to some of the, the impact and the importance of this work um, amongst our patients and families. So it talks about the fact that um, AV antibody pre-screening doesn't only um, have an effect on recruitment, but it's devastating for the families when they find out their children are being excluded. So how soon can we expect this to be a thing of the past? And will there be technologies being developed to circumvent the neutralising um, antibodies or to allow neutralising, I guess, of the AAV antibodies? Do you want me to jump in here, Sam? Yeah, thanks, Sam. I think that one's <laughs> um, So this is really a, a critical um, aspect of taking the technology forward. And there's considerable efforts across the globe in, in addressing this particular issue. Um, there's uh, some strategies that are looking to develop a, a decoy. So this is where you would take empty capsids and pepper them into a, a vector dose to um, try to um, partly neutralise pre-existing antibodies in that particular set of patients. Um, there's also enzymatic therapies where uh, there's transient degradation of IgG molecules that would lower these neutralizing antibody titers temporarily in order to get your vector system in and under the radar. Um, but we also have a considerable effort in this front from a research perspective where we have an HNMC funded project running where we're looking to effectively develop um, stealth variants of, of AAV delivery systems. So these would be systems that have been purposefully engineered to de-target antibody neutralization in certain sets of patients. So it's not something that has been overcome at the moment. Um, still at the, at, at the moment, as you say, Michelle, these pre-screens are being conducted. Um, patients need to um, fall under a certain antibody titer in order to receive eligibility to receive treatment. But there's a considerable effort on this front as the as the, the barriers to clinical translation are being stripped down and this particular matter is presenting itself, it is becoming more and more focused effort from a research perspective. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is also with regards to, I suppose, um, antibodies. So you've, you've spoken about a number of serotypes, um, Grant, obviously, particularly with regards to the AAV. If somebody has antibodies to say AAV9, but then another trial comes along um, in the same disease cohort and they are looking at say AAV2, would having antibodies to one serotype necessarily exclude you or, or from a medical perspective, should it exclude you from receiving another in terms of cross-reactivity? Sure. Um, there, is, there is a degree of cross-reactivity with all these capsid serotypes. Um, it would it would really depend on the empirical answer. So one would have to, um, you know, if a child had been precluded from an AV9 therapy and an AAV2 therapy came along, it would require another test against that particular vector system to really determine it. Um, at the moment, some companies are looking to use a particular capsid serotype called AV5. Um, and the reason that that, Part of the reason that's been chosen is because um, from a, a capsid relatedness issue, 
that's one of the most distantly related capsids from AV2. So the idea is that um, any natural immunity to AAV2 would have a lower degree of cross-reactivity to the AAV5 system. So um, getting back to your, your question, uh, there is cross-reactivity um, across the different serotypes, but one would really have to try it and see from on a patient-by-patient patient, um, basis to understand the degree to which that uh, level of immunity is present and whether that would preclude the patient from receiving an AV2 therapy bad AV9 antibodies. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question here from Laura. So do, so do the AAV antibodies vary over time? Like we can probably presume in some extent that they do. So what's the dynamic nature of that? And say if we find that a patient's positive and therefore excluded from receiving a therapy, do we have any sense of um, how long it will take for them to um, have a reduction in that antibody and therefore become eligible for that therapy? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, there, to my to my understanding, uh, there's there's not any um, studies that I know of that look at long term um, seroprevalence of AV antibodies in particular set of individuals over time. Um, so, you know, one of the problems of working with a vector system that's derived from a non pathogenic virus is it doesn't receive a lot of attention from a clinical perspective. Um, and so, um, you know, it's it's probably not possible to answer your question at this particular point. But what we do know is that um, children that have received Zolgensma have extraordinarily high levels of anti-AV9 levels. And in a couple of these patients that we've met, now been testing out to four years, we're finding that these really high levels of antibodies are, are stable and present even four years after initial infusion of therapy. So they, they, they rise over the first couple of months, they plateau, and then they're stable for years afterwards. And we're still in the process of, of, of studying these responses to see if they fall off over time. Um, you know, one of the other things that's important to consider here as well is that uh, certain patients might be receiving medication. So as you know, with your, your children receiving DMD, these children are um, on immunosuppressive steroids. Um, and, you know, not all patients are going to have the same level of seroprevalence. Um, when it comes to different AV cross-reactivity. So, you know, it, it, it's really very much a, a cohort by cohort basis as to understanding how long, you know, to what levels do these antibody titers rise and how long are they stable for? And that's a question I'd be really interested to, to, to pursue over time, not just in DMD kits, but in any, in any um, cohort of patients that might benefit from AV therapy. Okay, thank you. Um, another question I've received, um, there's quite a few questions coming in now, so um, is with regards to um, viral shedding. So one of the things that's come up in discussions that we've had about planning um, in some of our clinical trials has been the concern that if a child, I mean, obviously the, by the nature of the fact we're treating these genetic diseases, they're genetic, and so it's not uncommon for more than one child in the family to be affected. Um, so is there a risk that a child receives a gene therapy and then has shedding of that virus, thereby giving antibodies to, um, say, for example, a brother, rendering them ineligible for a trial moving forward? Um, do you want to, should I go again? You keep going. <laughs> okay. um, I, that's a really good question. Um, and I can't really give you a definitive answer. When uh, these trials um, come into to um, affect and families are considering these sorts of therapies. I mean, uh, they're closely scrutinized by um, certain regulatory authorities to make sure that they're safe, that the proper um, guidelines are in place when it comes to um, patient treatment immediately after infusion to make sure that they're not excreting or secreting these recombinant technologies um, into the environment. And that, you know, even if that were to happen, it's happening safely. Um, I think that there could be um, some aspect of what you're saying in terms of uh, exposure to, um, to shed rib, um, recombinant vector systems that then cross neutralize in, in a family member the, the ability. But I, I would suspect that the likelihood of that would be very low. I think it's important to take the precautions, but I think by virtue of the nature that it's a non-replicating virus, that the levels that are being shed 
um, would be relatively low compared to the dose. And that then, um, you know, it's not even an infection that occurs with recombinant technologies because these delivery systems aren't able to replicate. And on top of all of that, from the perspective of adeno-associated virus, it's, it's very low immunogenetically. Um, so I think there is a theoretical risk to what you say, but I think that the risk of that happening would be low. But I suspect that if I was a, a parent with that situation, I'd be taking very um, careful efforts to, to make sure that that theoretical thing didn't actually occur. Um, okay, thanks, Grant. Um, and then this all right, might ask a question to Sam. Um, we received a question from um, Dr. Nadia, or I should say Professor Nadia Bodawi, who's a um, neonatologist at the hospital, asking, what do you think the future is looking like for fetal gene therapy? Um, so that's another excellent question because there's going to be situations where, you know, if you wait till a child is born that, you know, it might be too late and, and treating early is is going to be really key to um, sort of clinical benefit. But um, at this stage, I haven't heard of anything um, coming through the pipeline um, for fetal gene therapy, but I know um, people are, you know, at least in preclinical models looking at um, treating, um, treating early. Uh, yeah, Grant, do you know of any fetal gene therapies? No, no, I don't know of anything that's been that adventurous. Yeah. And Sam, there's another question that I might ask you to comment on. Has there been any progress made towards vectors that are more exclusively brain targeting um, um, and can be and can be delivered, um, I guess, directly or system, um, systemically um, or even intrathecally, I suppose we can be thinking about, that may therefore be a little bit um, less concerning in terms of toxicity to the other organs? Yeah, look, this is a really... Um I guess a field of great study at the moment, um, not just in a, you know, particularly in AAV and our ability to, you know, change the capsid to, I guess, direct the, the gene delivery system to, to where we want to go. So, you know, for, for something like Gensmo, the doses, um, you know, that these children need to treat, even with AAV9, which we know can cross the blood brain barrier, but it doesn't do that as efficiently as it could. And a lot of um, vector does end up in the liver, and there has been issues with obviously liver toxicity. Um, so, to address that, um, you know, there's a lot of work in the field to develop novel capsids. So, either taking existing capsids and trying to um, confer new properties where they might be able to um, cross the blood brain barrier or even just to detarget from the liver. So um, even um, work here at the, um, at the CMRI, we have groups that are, um, you know, individuals that are looking to try and detarget the liver. So, you know, can we take a capsid and, you know, while the liver is a great um, target for AAV in particular, um, can we, you know, reduce the load on the liver while trying to increase the specificity for other um, other organs, so that's um, something that's definitely very um, actively being researched in the field. Thank you. Um, and I guess yeah, along a similar line, in terms of um, looking to the future and minimising toxicity, um, Sandra Charlton asks that having worked, so Sandra um, is one of our very experienced gene therapy um, clinical nurse consultants. So having worked with Zolgens now for past three years and taking into account the viral vector load and the subsequent clinical side effects, um, particularly related to the liver, is there um, work being done and, and how far has it come in terms of being able to increase the carrying capacity of the transgenes? And can this have, therefore limit the viral load um, mm -hmm. and mediate some of the side effects, the dose-related effects? Yeah, so this is another, you know, great question and, and what sort of capsid engineering is trying to address. So while AAV has a, a limited packaging capacity, um, so we can't um, change the, the sort of the size of what we can put into the AAV, if we're able to deliver um, with greater specificity and greater efficiency, we can reduce the overall dose that um, is required to achieve the same therapeutic effects. So um, definitely, um, you know, there's large programs where people are trying to screen and develop new AV capsids, um, you know, with this, with this goal in mind. So can we deliver the, the therapy, you know, to the cell types that we want? So can we, you know, 
detarget the liver, reach the central nervous system more efficiently or any other organ. And if we can increase the efficiency and specificity, we can treat with lower doses, which should overall reduce the viral load, um, you know, which is a very important safety feature. Okay, thank you. Um, another question in regards to, I think, the pathogenicity or the, and, and I guess the effects of the virus. Um, Grant, you commented that the AAV is kind of not a disease causing virus. I guess most of the research we have is um, on naturally occurring doses in relatively healthy populations. So um, as you would be aware, we're currently preparing to dose gene therapy in DMD um, patients on the ward. And one of the questions I've received from the nursing staff is, you know, we have immunosuppressed patients in the, ne in the next beds. Um, do we need to be worried about, about I guess, um, both, well, I guess, shedding, but also could this virus make children sick if they are having, a, you, know, a, you know, suppressed because of therapies that they're on? Um, and, and do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think it would be safe for you to infuse a child with DMD with an AV delivery system and have an immunosuppressed child on the same water in the same room. I mean, these, these um, infusions are delivered over a you know, period of an hour. Um, they're replication incompetent viral systems. So um, it's not that there's an infection that increases viral load once the infusion goes in. Um, you know, it is, it is delivered to the patient and, you know, this patient may start to excrete or secrete the virus over the next couple of days, but I believe even if it were to, um, you know, somehow get into a, a different patient who is on immunosuppression, that it wouldn't really, it wouldn't be sufficient to cause disease. I mean, AAV doesn't cause acute pathology itself. Um, the transgene is usually only beneficial for the patient that's receiving it, so it's unlikely to have any sort of toxicity associated with it. Um, and even then, you know, the amount of vector exposure would be um, so remotely small that um, you know it's not going to have any sort of allergenic or, or yeah. you know, immunostimulatory effect. Okay, great, thank you. That's really sure. Um, and then a question um, from Christina Elvidge. Um, so. We've talked about, I guess, the negative um, or the, I guess the devastating effects when you might tell a family that their child's been um, actually has been exposed and they're, and they're positive and therefore excluded from a trial. But what about when we might be starting to look at predictive screening for patients and find that they're negative and they might not actually be getting dosed for six months or even 12 months? So, you know, you showed rates of almost up to 50% in some populations of AAB. Mm. So would you suggest... Um, a process where you you would we suggest to families that they isolate their children that they try to keep them away from daycares um how do we uh, support families really in that kind of difficult waiting time yeah that would be that would be agonizing i think um you know you've got a therapy coming down the pike that could potentially be very effective and you know you want to avoid that sort of natural exposure um you know i think we all understand that Childcare centres are an incredibly um, rich source of viral infections. Um, AAV is you know, associated with adenovirus, hence the name. It's also in, associated with certain herpes viruses as well. Um, and I guess, you know, I think I would probably be trying to take a great deal of precaution in, in your, what my child was exposed to if there was a therapy that was, that was imminent and, and coming along so you know I couldn't answer this on you know even on a case-by-case -case situation but you know, if I was a parent I think I would be taking every effort to make sure that my child wasn't unduly exposed to natural infection while, while trying to maintain you know not, not solitary you know yes. containment of my child so that socially they were developing as, as you would like them to. So I look, I, I can't answer the question. I think that comes down to the individual, but I would, you know, if there was if this AV therapy was looking promising, I would probably be trying to wrap my child in cotton wool for the next six months until they manage to get a treatment. Yeah, okay. No, thank you. Um, so I have um, another question that's come in from the audience. So um, 
Richard Mitchell says, thanks for a great talk. So um, the recent experience of the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine, um, where he comments that in some instances this got into the patient bone marrow and caused thrombosis. So is this suggesting an example of AAV being hard to control? Um, and do you see other barriers to certain types of therapy um, in this kind of field? And possibly... Um, Maybe even do you want to comment on the difference between kind of AAV-based vaccine versus kind of gene therapy? Do you want to answer this one, Sam? Um, well, I guess I would start by saying there's adenovirus and AAV. Um, so I guess they're two different um, viral vector systems, but I guess the, um, you know, this could apply to any viral vector system. Uh, so I think... Uh, you know, when you're considering systemic delivery, I think, um, you know, you do have to consider where the device is going to go. Um, you know, you can control potentially expression um, of, of your treatment by using tissue-specific promoters, or you might include some regulatory sequences that might be able to switch um, that gene off um, in a particular cell type. So these sorts of um, additional layers of um, safety can be built into the vector system, but, um, you know, for something like a lentiviral vector, you know, where you have a very broad, um, it has a V3G envelope, uh, which has very broad tropism, uh, I think you definitely have to be aware that these can, can go um, elsewhere, um, particularly with systemic um, injections. Grant, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Else. The only thing I'd add is that um, it, it's a common, um, it's a common, um, it's common for people to think that adenovirus and AAV are the same thing by virtue of the overlap of the name. Unfortunately, virologists weren't an imaginative group and they just always called the virus by, you know, the place it was found or how it was found. And so as AAV was found as a contaminant of adenovirus, it adopted the name adeno-associated virus. So I think it would be good these days to call it human parvovirus just by to, to make that distinction. Um, and, and the reason that adenovirus was chosen as the AstraZeneca you know, vaccine platform was because it is highly immunogenic. AV doesn't have the same degree of immunogenicity. It is being developed as a vaccine system, but that's not come out yet. Um, but there are publications out there showing it can be used for certain delivery um, and vaccine stimulation. But you know, adenovirus is the basis of the AstraZeneca platform. It's no related, no way related to, to AAV. Looks like uh, we're almost out of time, but perhaps we've got time for one more question. Uh, yes, so I just wanted to end on a, I guess, an aspirational type of question, Grant and Sam. But um, what do you see as being the kind of blue sky, um, you know, I guess ceiling for what you think we can achieve? What do you think is the kind of exhaustive um, scope of, you know, diseases that you think that AAV um, gene therapies would be able to tackle? You go, Sam. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I would say I think that um, as technology develops, probably, you know, there's nothing off limits um, if you can configure the, the system. So I think, you know, back in the year 2000, someone said... Um, um, from Indiverma, there was a publication where he said that gene delivery is the Achilles heel. And I think, you know, that's still true today. So if you can deliver, um, you know, that sort of cargo, whether it be, you know, a gene addition approach, genome editing technology, you know, if you can do that efficiently in enough cells, I think any um, therapeutic target is potentially possible. Yeah, I, I'd just add to that and I'd say that um you know, my feeling is that the, um, the blue sky is only, you know, it's, it's only bridled by one's imagination. This is a really innovative approach to medicine. It's never happened before. The um, technology is supremely advanced that we're starting to tackle those diseases that are the lowest hanging fruit. Um, and and I think that, you know, we're, we're, we're going to move, I mean, CAR-T therapies are showing that we're moving away from just treating um, people that have genetic diseases or genetic disorders to ones where we could treat cancer. And, you know, we could be treating um, auto-inflammatory diseases, you know, anything. Um, the, the thing that we often talk about amongst the group is sort of the biblical proportions of what we're witnessing right now. 
And one of the things I'd love to see is treatment for deafness come along because at the moment, you know, the adage that we have is that gene therapy is, um, you know, the lame shall walk, the blind shall see. And if the deaf could hear, that would just be a nice thing to add to the whole thing. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I think sky is the limit, Michelle. We could, we could be going off into outer space, I think, if we just let our imaginations run wild. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. I think we're almost out of time. Um, if there's any questions that we haven't answered, um, we'll, we'll try to do so via our website in the coming days. So perhaps look out for that. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, you'll agree that this has been a very informative uh, webinar. A video of the webinar will be available via our uh, website and the SCHN uh, Sydney Children's Hospital Network YouTube channel. There will also be a short survey at the end of this. So if you have a moment, please do fill it out as we would appreciate your feedback. Thank you again to our panel of experts for the fantastic webinar today. To our Q&A facilitator, Michelle, and to our contributors, including Luminescence, Alliance, and more importantly, to you, the audience, for your active participation. A special thanks as well to the staff at SCHN who have supported today's presentations. Stay tuned for our next webinar. We we'll look forward to seeing you again. Goodbye for now.